I knew early on that we needed to settle the food problem because if you can grow food, it's empowering. In fact, I believe growing food is one of the most dangerous occupations on the face of this earth because you are in danger of becoming free. We live on a typical city lot, 66 feet by 132 feet. That's a fifth of an acre. Take away the house, the garage, and the concrete areas, and we're left with only one-tenth of an acre of land to grow food on. Trying to become self-sufficient in a location one mile from downtown Pasadena has made us turn this home into an urban homestead. We are pioneering a journey towards self-sufficiency one step at a time. There were no models to follow. We just did it and learned by trial and error. We're not just gardening, we're not just making biodiesel, or using solar, or just raising city farm animals. It's a combination of doing everything well, or at least good enough to survive. We've tried to live lightly for as long as I can remember, and Dad, Dad was a real hippie. But the times have changed, and he's gone from being hippie to hip. But for us kids, that's how it's always been. When people ask me what I do, I like to say I'm a 21st century Laura Ingalls. We're urban homesteaders, and this is our little homestead in the city. My transformation started during the hippie era. I was part of that movement, and the defining moment for me had to do with the Vietnam War. My generation was graduating from college, and we were being subject to the draft. The war ended the fun times for me, and I had to be serious about things. I found myself thinking, hey, wait a minute. There are different ideas, alternatives to think about. And so I put on the brakes and backtracked and asked, what can I do that I really want to do, that I really need to do? I started asking questions. What are we here for? And what are we put on this earth to do? And asking questions, I guess that's a dangerous thing. Some of my generation found peace in a back to the land movement while I immigrated to New Zealand in 1973, where I started my first homestead in an abandoned gold town. A combination of circumstances brought me back to the States where I settled on 10 acres of land in Florida. There I worked in lawn maintenance and raised bees, having a small honey business. In the mid-1980s, I changed direction and made my way to Southern California, where I purchased a fixer-upper house in a redevelopment neighborhood. Here I planted a hobby garden in a corner of the backyard, but what I harvested was only a bonus. I never really relied on it for our daily food. I didn't intend to stay very long here, but while I was dreaming of moving back to the country somewhere, reality intervened. In the early 90s, Southern California experienced a drought so severe that water rates were increased for higher usage. This is my front yard, and this is the first area where I decided to take a stand and plant something useful instead of grass. I knew that grass was costing me too much, too much time, too much water, and now too much money. It would never look that good, and I decided to make some changes that were pretty radical. My lawn fell victim to six inches of mulch. This drastic step of turning away from the American lawn fetish would prove to be the major factor in turning our ordinary home into an extraordinary urban homestead. In 2001, when I found out that genetically modified food had entered the food supply, I said, you did what? To me, to my food, and to my children? As soon as I knew that they had attacked my children with this foreign element, I got mad and I said I had to stop this once and for all because we were just fiddling around. This was a seminal moment for me. I said, I'm not going to take this any longer. I knew I couldn't do anything about the air we breathe or the water we drink. But when it came to putting this alien food into my children's mouth, I wasn't going to let that happen. So I told my family, we are going to grow as much food as we can here. My garden, as I saw it, had become my Alamo. This is the original backyard garden 20 years ago. 
Hey, so I went a little crazy. And then dad started taking over every square inch, horizontal, vertical. And the front yard, the backyard. And the driveway. Oh yes, I wanted acreage. I wanted lots of acres. But we had to make a go of it with what we had. You know, you have to rethink the possible. And I think this is the example of showing what you can do if you start with what you have. You have to do something different and change your world. Everything is really tight. Our tiny lot has forced us to innovate and come up with new ways to get the most out of this place. We call this the square inch method of gardening and we mimic how nature grows close together. This saves us water and attracts beneficial insects too. This is the soil we have today. It's alive and much healthier than we had before. What used to be here was dry, adobe-type soil that became hard as a rock and water would just run off it. It took a long time, uh, about 20 years worth of mulch and compost. We're even moving up in the world. We're about a foot and a half higher than our next door neighbor. 26 pounds of cucumbers, 81 pounds of salad. A lot of people started paying attention to what we were doing and how we were growing our own food in the city because we grew 6,000 pounds of fruits and vegetables each year on a tenth of an acre of cultivated land. They say the average salad travels some 1,400 miles to get to the table. We chose to go a step backwards. Our salad travels 40 feet to our table, many steps backwards. In the summer, our garden can produce up to 80% of our vegetarian diet. In the winter, we get about 50 to 60%. Here's what we do at some of our harvests. It's food security at its best. We're really reducing our food miles this way. I know there's the 100 mile diet, but this, this is the 100 foot diet. Eating from the land and with the seasons, it can get repetitive. There was one time we had this soup for, I think it was six meals in a row. I call it the 007 soup because it never died. It kept being served over and over and over again. I mean, there was nothing wrong with the soup. We're indirectly and directly self-sufficient. We can't grow everything we need from our gardens, so we sell the excess produce, cash crops, to area restaurants and individuals. That income goes toward buying staples such as flour, rice, sugar, and dried beans. We've got chocolate. Chocolate's a staple. Hi. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Right. Your eggs and your salad. Oh, wonderful. You know, there's always such raves about the organic mixed greens because we always like to feature the name Dervais. There's something about produce or eggs that are that fresh that are not like anything that you would experience from where we traditionally get our produce. Myself and my other cooks, we just sort of pass everything around and we're all kind of in awe at how beautiful and just crisp and delicious all the different things that we're getting. And so it's a real honor to be able to work with such first-class ingredients. It's, it's pretty amazing. In the past, people have been gardening, growing their own food for a long time. It went out of style when we could get produce from all around the world. But now, facing the future we have today, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we want to get produce from all around the world? Do we want to get produce out of season? You see, we just picked that produce today. It's almost like the chef has his own garden. It doesn't go through any middlemen or any extra handling. When we pick it, it goes a direct route to the chef. I decided to take a stand against the ills of society, tackling all aspects of our life. After food came energy, then transportation, water, and waste, the whole walk. This is our biodiesel processor. The waste oil comes from one of our clients. We try not to drive very much, so we use less than 25 gallons a month. Even though we have solar, we still try to live a simple, low-impact lifestyle. A good piece of rope is the only clothes dryer I've ever used. Except for the energy-efficient refrigerator, our kitchen's pretty simple. We like to say it's unplugged. We filled it with newfangled and old-fashioned hand-cranked appliances. Juicer, food processor, feeder, grinder, 
and hand crank blender, which give us a good workout. This is Lucy, she's one of our Bantam chickens. We have chickens, ducks, and goats. We don't have the space of a typical farm, so we have figured out what is best for healthy, organic, and holistic management. And how to take farm animals and make them city by. Because we are vegetarians, we rely on these animals strictly for eggs and milk. They eat the kitchen and garden waste, and we think they are the cutest composting system ever. The family pets are an important and contributing part to the urban homestead. Well, most of them are. We must get rid of negativity because we are all plagued by doubts. When I first started this, I didn't believe I could do it. So you have to take a risk. You have to go out on a limb and believe that you can try to do something that you've never tried before. If we stop being negative and try to do the right thing, we can do something positive. We must say to ourselves that we can do something. That's a start we all have to make. Don't look for others to change. You start by changing yourself. The government can't do it and the corporations won't do it. So what we have to do is take a look at ourselves and point the finger straight back at us and ask the question, what can I do? Because change begins with me. I think the urban farm sets a wonderful example for the entire community and I think learning about caring for the earth and the sustainability of the earth begins with very young children and if they can learn about that at a young age it is something that uh, stays with them as they grow later into life. I've known Justin and his sisters and Jules for over eight years now. When I first came here, the home, it didn't look like this. I always used to look across the street. I would see them all working. I saw the transformation of their home. I see they just do wonderful things in the community and the yard speaks for itself. Passion takes on a purpose When searching ones embrace the light Skeptics find themselves down on their knees You'll know it's here When the lost find the name 